thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Adrian. I always forget um, how bad it feels to be <laughs> introduced or how embarrassing or something. I feel like looking down. Um, we're, Lizzie and I are super, super happy to be with you all today. Um, I know Lizzie has a special connection being an alumni, and um, I'm just meeting the LCOE and have been really so excited to work with their team and to be here with you all today. I just want to say a word about what Greg said about um, us all being sort of practice-based researchers in this. Uh, Lizzie and I are, we consider ourselves shoulder to shoulder fellow travelers with all of you in this. And we have a lot of excitement about telehealth and we have a lot of cautions and concerns about telehealth like I'm sure all of you do. And um, we, we want to uh, encourage, um, inspire, hope, all of you to continue to engage in your own practice-based learnings and really um, you know, elevate what you feel like you're learning, the concerns that you're seeing, the health disparities that you're worried about, the promises of what you see, the differences in the experience, and, and to really write about it and share more widely about it. And we hope that this, you know, there becomes a larger and larger community of social workers in particular um, where we have a body of practice-based learnings um, and that all of your voices will be there too. So we, this is, uh, we have structured this to be an hour and we're going to have a period of some practice where we're going to do breakout groups for a short period of time. Um, and then there's 30 minutes where we'll be able to have a discussion. So we're really looking forward to that, hearing from you. We know many of you have been doing telehealth. Um, and already have experience doing this, uh, maybe going into doing it in this next semester. So we really want to hear from all of you. I do have the chat box open. And um, even though we're, we do have that 30 minutes of time where we can discuss, we would love to hear your thoughts, questions, um, contributions throughout. Please don't hold back and go ahead and chat in. I'll watch when Lizzie's talking, Lizzie will watch when I'm talking. Um, Vera and Jessica are going to help us too. So we'll really, we'd like to have a conversation um, as much as possible in a format like this. So I just wanted to say um, before we dive in that these two pictures are Lizzie and I really, I think, days before the shelter in place order. <laughs> um, so I was in Santa Cruz and I think Lizzie was close there in her, um, uh, close there in her backyard, not really her backyard, but close by. Um, and I just wanted to sort of contextualize the moment that we're all finding ourselves in that can feel a little apocalyptic, I think, um, between the pandemic and the fires and the administration and the continued violence um, towards people of color and black people in particular, the horrifying violence. And so I feel like every time we're going into talking to a group, um, I don't want to act like everything's normal. I want to acknowledge the moment. And at the same time, I, you know, we never know what to do except just to keep on working and try to be doing good work. And so just want to acknowledge that that's, that's the point that we're all finding ourselves in and to thank you all for being willing to spend this time with us. We wanted to just take a couple polls really quick to get a pulse. So Vera, if you can launch that first poll, um, we'd love to just know, get a ballpark about where you are all at with telehealth. Yeah, thanks. I see. It. I saw a bunch of people jump in. So thank you so much for your participation. Um, I can see those numbers going way up. And interesting, a, a, a big variation. Um, all right, Vera, when you see things start to slow down, if you want to go ahead and close it and share it out, that would be great. Hey, Elizabeth, this is Vera. I put the two polls together. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, yes. Thank you. I saw that and I see people did answer. So thank you. Um, so it looks like, yeah, really interesting. So big variation on what percentage of telephone and video services did you engage in 
last semester. So it looked almost evenly split from those of you who were doing quite a bit, over 50%, and a good chunk of you that didn't do any. Um, and then for what do you know about phone and video services at your placement this year, uh, so 11% aren't going to be doing any and 41% primarily telehealth. So again, a big, a big range. Uh, I do want to say that um, for those of you who won't be doing any or who didn't do any, special thanks to you for joining. Um, I also want to say that for, for those of you in those categories and for those of you who may be macro students, um, that the, uh, much of what we're going to talk about today in terms of what our practice-based learnings have been and the intersection with health equity and the intersection with some of the previous research and early learning really are things around relationship building through telehealth. So we know that that is the crux of where all help, you know, uh, where all help and healing occurs is in uh, a caring relationship. And so um, even if you're not doing clinical work or you won't be doing telehealth, I know all of us are doing our primarily all of our interactions, whether it's with colleagues, whether it's with classes, um, uh, through, through video and phone. So all of the strategies that we're going to talk about today apply to any relationship and interaction on telehealth. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you, Lizzie. Great. So we wanted to um, frame today kind of the umbrella that we're working under is the is the construct of health equity and share our excitement about telehealth, frankly, as a social justice tool, um, which I guess at first pass sort of seems like how how could that be. But one of the things that's happened as part of um, our nation being in uh, what's a federally classified emergency is that telehealth has become reimbursable in a way that it never was before. And so what we've seen is that telehealth has become a tool for increasing access to everyone and it or it can be a tool for increasing access because it's now reimbursable. So folks that we used to require to come in to a brick and mortar building because that's how we could get reimbursed, we no longer have to do that. And so from a social work perspective, you know, we're literally able to meet patients where they are, right? Literally able to see a person in their environment. Um, and so that's really the frame that we're working under and, and of course acknowledging that it's not a perfect system yet. And really the caution that we are holding and want you to hold is how do we make sure that it actually is a tool for health equity? What, what practices do we need to add as clinicians, as future administrators for you MAP students, um, in terms of making sure that everybody does have equitable access to this tool that can be so powerful? All right, next slide. Um, I want to just tack on to that one other sort of push for all of you as Lizzie's talking about health equity and telehealth and those intersections, that part of our investment and encouragement and hope and desire about having social worker voices at the forefront as this telehealth service continues to get developed is that we we, we have the health equity piece, we have the advocacy piece, we have the sort of global perspective and the social justice perspective. And we really don't want these services to get increasingly shaped up and sort of programmed and um, medicalized in some way that doesn't really account for the social justice implications, uh, both consequences and potential benefits. Um, so it, with health equity as the umbrella of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we would put empathy, you know, as a pillar sort of under that umbrella. And it's really because um, this sort of premise that empathy is healing and we have tons and tons and tons of robust research, which is deeply fascinating from Carl Rogers 120 years ago all the way through today, stuff that's being released. And really what we know is that there isn't, um, there isn't any help that happens unless people feel an empathic connection. And that doesn't mean that we have to see people 10 times. That doesn't mean we have to spend an hour and a half with people. It's not time sensitive. And in fact, all of us can feel it 
in a minute or so when we get on the phone with somebody, when we go to interact with somebody at a store that we're at, when we order coffee, we, we can all feel it immediately. So it isn't necessarily that these have to be longstanding relationships. The empathic connection, though, needs to be established really early on and maintained. And I think it's another area where our discipline um, really, really knocks it out of the park. And so I think we have this understanding in a really deep way. The opposite of empathy is judgment and bias and stigma. And I would put all of those in sort of a bucket together that if we think about judgment being the opposite of empathy, sort of on a, um, a seesaw, that the more empathic we're feeling with people, you know, the, the less judgmental we're feeling. And the more judgmental we're feeling with people, the less empathic we are, which is why we're trained to really identify ourselves, what's going on with me, what am I feeling, so that we can identify that and correct it and do something about it. Um, bias, obviously, is explicit or implicit um, judgment. It's, it's really not being able to connect to someone as a human. And in fact, ultimately, it's not relating to them as a full human, as an equal full human. And so then we treat people differently. Um, and stigma is really a word, of course, that we find um, is really how this is talked about more in the mental health field. So if we think about people with severe mental, uh, mental health conditions, if we think about people with addictive disorders, a lot of times we talk about stigma. And the reason I, I sort of bucket those is that we know that um, judgment, bias, and stigma and, um, are disproportionately aimed at historically marginalized and stigmatized populations. And so that all by itself is like judgment, bias, and stigma are not equally distributed. <laughs> you know, that there are um, that people in the queer community, people of color, uh, absolutely uh, black people. Um, we're talking about people with disabilities, people with addictive disorders. And so when we're, so we're talking about populations that when, when, when empathy isn't sufficiently communicated, when it isn't sufficiently established, um, that these people are getting much poorer care. And in fact, empathy is so closely related to health outcomes that it's, it's really that we're giving people a different medication. If, if we're not sufficiently connecting with them, then they heal less quick. So wounds take longer to heal and um, uh, chronic pain is worse. We know that people don't adhere to recommendations because if we don't feel like someone cares about that, us, we don't trust them, so we don't do what they suggest. Um, we probably shouldn't trust people that we don't feel empathy from. It's not a bad decision. It just means that um, you know, we're not gonna follow the recommendations and it, uh, it dramatically impacts our experience of care. Um, and the care we provide uh, for the people that we serve and um, patient experience and client experience is directly related to health outcomes. So this is really all to say that as we think about health equity and think about how empathy intersects with that and think about the people who, are, who empathy is frequently withheld from in social services or in health settings. And then we think about empathy's um, connection to health outcomes and improvements in health, then really when we're not able to sufficiently connect with someone and develop an empathic connection, we're essentially giving them much poor care. Um, so that, that's why part of the reason that Lizzie and I are so deeply interested in telehealth and just really making sure that we can figure out together how to do that sufficiently. Okay. So we've kind of given you the framing that we're working under, and we're going to transition a little bit to nuts and bolts. So what does this look like? Um, and when we were talking with the, the team from LCOE um, and, uh, and Greg and others, you know, a lot of the concern that we know um, you all have voiced is like, how do I make this transition? Um, how do I bring patients in, what is actually different about the clinical encounter. Um, and really, one of the, key, the foundational pieces of telehealth um, is being able to shape expectations and that setup, um, where we're congruently at the same time addressing some of the technological or literacy issues that may be happening as part of the health equity frame and setting up a framework where we can convey empathy and engage. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that now. 
So the way that we kind of have conceptualized the setup are three buckets. So, so the first one for you all to think about, and, and I really want you to imagine, and even if you're in, a, a, in management and planning and maybe not necessarily um, working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, um, but you're gonna be coaching folks and you're gonna be helping set up systems such that clinicians can do this. So the first bucket is preparing. So, so really it's the pre-step to your first um, session with a client. And we know some of you are gonna be in hospitals, that, but so think of this as where you're going to be. Um, but really the preparation stage is the, the main health equity piece, right? Is, is making sure that the technology fits for yourself and for the patient. Um, I'm in primary care, we say patients, clients, consumers, please use the appropriate term. Um, so that, that means a couple of things. One is making sure that you know, your camera works, that you have a good internet connection, that you're familiar with the technology. So are you using Zoom? Are you using um, Doxy? Um, and then ideally it's either you or some agencies have now care navigators that can help, but actually prepping the, the client ahead of time. So before the visit, what is it gonna be, right? You're gonna get a text message with a link, um, making sure that the client has internet connection, right? Um, a lot of folks don't, and so do you need to pivot to a phone call? Um, really, really, really um, before the visit, addressing those technological issues that may be coming up, um, and there's maybe a place for advocacy. So consent, and we know that this was an issue. How do you consent somebody over the phone, over telehealth? It's actually not that different. And I think that's a theme we're gonna come back to quite a bit today. It's like, a lot of this isn't that different. Um, it may be verbal, um, but the consent ideally could happen before the visit and addressing any privacy issues. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about how you can orient um, a client to privacy issues, but the consent can be about, okay, when do I have to break confidentiality, but also, is there anybody else in your house um, that may overhear you? Do you have a private space that you can be? Um, what about head, a headset? Um, those kinds of things are really important for the preparation stage because we no longer, we no longer have the, the walk from the waiting room to our office and we no longer have our office where we close the door. And so because this is newer for many folks, although not for everyone, um, giving them that prep ahead of time is so important and addressing their questions or concerns ahead of time is gonna make that first visit much easier. Okay, so the second bucket is contextualizing. Oops, can we go back? Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. The second bucket is contextualizing. And that is, you're in your visit. You're, you're, you, we have the connection and the um, welcome to my office is kind of like, what does this look like now? Um, so shaping expectations in terms of what's, what's different today. So, you know, uh, we're going to model this for you, but um, checking in, can you see me okay? Can you hear me? Um, it's really the, um, the moment to set the agenda. Um, so how long we have to meet today. Um, and here is where we are also going to address safety. So um, this has come up quite a bit and I think it tends to be like the number one anxiety um, of like, what if there's an emergency? What if there's a crisis? Um, because usually we have someone right there with us. We can be like, hang on a sec, right? Or let me make a phone call and I have you here and I know nothing bad is gonna happen to you while I have you in front of me. Really when we're doing telehealth, um, well, and actually I wanna point out, Greg brought up something really important. Many of you have probably worked on crisis hotlines. So, you know, in many ways this isn't new um, in terms of like most suicide, uh, well, hotlines are telephonic, right? So there, there is precedent for this. But before you start the visit, checking in on, let me just make sure I have the address of where you are right now. Um, and it, the callback number, if we get disconnected, um, can, is this the right number? 
seeing if there's anybody else around just in case something comes up that you need to bring maybe bring somebody else into the room. Um, so that's kind of like, in a way, it's sort of like the throat clearing. Um, and then number three is connecting. And that's where we're going to use the um, engagement strategies, the empathic communication strategies that we're going to talk about. So really, stages one and two or buckets one and two are really just kind of, in a way, it's like setting up your office um, just as you would in person. Okay. We wanted to talk about just a couple things that we have found. Um, we know that we can't sufficiently communicate empathy or develop an empathic relationship with somebody unless we're present, um, unless we're in the moment, since that's where the empathic relationship happens. And we know that there are tons of barriers to that, even when we see people in person. There are a lot of barriers to that. The barriers, Lizzie and I have found that the barriers are higher with telehealth. And so we need to take more care and more purposefulness around supporting ourselves to be able to be present. So we're gonna talk about just a couple of those next. Elizabeth, um, there's a question yeah. in the chat. So Shatisha says, yeah. just curious if you can talk about the requirement or recommendation of having a video on when participating in telehealth. Is that important or necessary want to be mindful of placing those expectations on the client when some folks don't like being on video or can't, for example, while also balancing the need, if relevant, to see the client. Um, and it yeah. sounds like other people uh, like yes to that. Um, I sort of like, like, when I read it, I was like, oh, like asking a patient, like it's really just, just preference. The idea that we would do anything that isn't the client's preference is baffling to me. Um, Right, like we would, we would just want to ask the client, what, what do they prefer, and do what they prefer. Lizzie, what, see, what yeah. are your? Absolutely. I haven't heard about requirement. Yeah, um, and I haven't either. And in some ways, you know, I know we're gonna have more time to talk about this. But it's like I want to dive into this with you all. Um, I think once we start talking about requirements, then it makes me wonder about equity, um, um, and it makes me wonder about power differentials. Uh, because we can only require something from someone when we have a power differential with them. Um, yeah. And just to add that I see that conversation in the, in the preparation bucket, right? So we're going to have a visit. It's going to be different. It's going to be remote. So usually when I talk to patients, I'll just ask them, you know, we can do a video visit or a telephone visit. Do you have a preference? Um, I think the thing we want to suss out, and we were talking about this with the LCOE team, is is it about a preference or is it about an access issue? And those are kind of two different paths, right? If a client is like, I just really don't wanna be on camera and I wanna be on the phone, thanks, that's great. But they're like, phone, I wish I could be on video. I don't really know how to do that. Or I'm not sure if my internet connection is good. That may, that may present a different path of helping that patient navigate that. Oh, lots of chats yeah. coming in. Yeah, I just, I put a pin in this and Greg had chatted in he's thinking about child welfare. Um, so I want to put a pin in this because it, it does seem like a really important piece, but let's come back to that. And we also want to hear from you then um, during the discussion. Okay. So related to this, um, and this is actually a good segue because we're talking about what if someone doesn't want to be on camera. And Elizabeth and I have had a lot of conversations of you know, in many ways, if you get somebody on camera and you're doing like video visit, it's much more similar to in person, right? Because we can, we can read those cues, um, all of the, the facial expressions, body language. Um, and, and so in some ways, it's not that different. There's a technological piece and some of the little um, nuts and bolts that we'll talk about, but, um, but the phone is harder um, and it's different. And, and I would say right now in practice, about 80% of my patients um, are preferring to do the phone. It seems like easier, there's less barriers. And I know when we talked about it with the team, that seems to be the, the common um, kind of ratio is the majority of visits right now are happening over the phone for, for a variety of reasons. So we wanted to talk you know, a little- I wanted to say something about the chat because I know we're gonna talk here about what we found about not looking at anything else when we're on the phone in order to try to support ourselves to be present for somebody. 
Um, and uh, I just want to read what um, Gilbert chatted in, which was, it's very much about client's pre client preference. I think a lot about how do you hold a healing and restorative conversation over the phone with a friend that opens up so many doors to understanding how empathy can be built over text or even a phone call. And I just wanted to underscore that, that um, I was telling Lizzie that I, when I started doing sessions on the phone and was realizing that if I looked at anything else, it took me out of being with that person. So I started looking at my lap only, and it reminded me of like my long-term boyfriend that I had in college, or long distance, I mean, before computers. And so we were just on the phone and like just wanting, you know, your love. I wanted to be so with him. So you would just look at nothing to try to really be there. And it's really the same attention and purposefulness that we want to bring to a patient interaction. So um, I love what you said, Gilbert, because I think we can take our experiences with family and friends um, and extrapolate um, to patient care. Absolutely. And with that said, you know, we, I wanted to talk about the research, the neuroscience on um, brain changes that happen when uh, for, for people who are blind or um, visually impaired, which is that the neurocircuitry in our brains actually rewires. So they've actually done quite a few studies of this and that the brain actually reroutes the neurons that would be associated with vision to um, hearing and to touch and taste so that in some ways um, folks who are blind actually can map sight by using their other senses, which is actually amazing. Like, so they see those neurons light up, the visual neurons, um, when they're hearing something, when they're touching something, which is pretty amazing and speaks to brain plasticity, um, certainly mm -hmm. over time. But actually, I wanted to point out that there's, you know, there is this trend now of like sensory deprivation because we know it heightens the other senses. Um, so, so there are people now who will like dine in, in the darkness so that they can taste the food better. Um, so just to say that when we are on the phone, we can use our other senses to make those connections. Okay. All right, so with regard to when we are on video, um, you know, we just, one of our big tips for everyone, for all of us, um, and I know Elizabeth and I have already done this today for this presentation, is to yeah. like hide the self view, right? Because there's yeah. nothing more distracting than like the horror of your, of my, uh, not yours, my own reflection, right? Like, oh gosh, what do I look like when I'm saying that? So we really, we, you know, we said that the in-person, uh, the video session is most like in-person, except in-person, there's not a video or a mirror behind the, the client that we're looking at. Um, so cover up your, your view of yourself if it needs to be on a post-it, if you're not using the technology that has the self-view hide feature. Um, but this is one of the most important things is like yeah. to get out of our own heads and to be empathically present. And then finally, so for, for nuts and bolts, right? Managing the alerts. So one of the things that's happened um, with, with most folks uh, working remotely now is that we have to be on a lot of devices, right? So I know when I'm doing telehealth, I, it, I'll have, if I'm not careful, instant messages coming up from my team. I've got text messages plus emails, you know? And so we have to really, really mind this because Unlike in, in the office where we, we can put the sort of in session on our sign, on a sign on our doors, we have to do that remotely now and really, really silence mm -hmm. alerts um, because otherwise we're not going to be, we're not going to be present. Mm -hmm. This actually, I actually screenshotted my own phone because I was doing a session with somebody on the phone and these alerts were rolling in and I finally said to them, I need to take care of something and call you back because I think that, you know, we're all, we're all sort of increasingly ADD in this world and this idea of being able to be sort of multitasking, we know is a fallacy. The research does not support that. Multitasking is impossible. We're just switching back and forth between two tasks. And, you know, to pull us out of the possibility for real presence with someone and to hold that space with them, 
constantly like watching these alerts, it's just, um, it, it, it's at odds with our goal of being with people. The, um, the only other thing I would add is that many of us, you know, I know for me right now, when there's an emergency, it comes through in, um, in an instant message. And so, you know, I can't turn that off, but what I can do and what, what we would recommend is, um, bringing that into the, you know, I may get interrupted. I just need to let you know if I hear a ding, I may just need to check it and to narrate what you're doing. It's the new reality. Um, we're gonna um, talk a little bit about these sort of core empathic communication strategies that you all, I'm sure are, well, I know you're, you're doing them. You're doing them with clients and if you're um, not, doing it with clients, if you're macro, or even if you're not, you're doing it with friends, you're doing it with families, you're doing it with your parents, you're doing it with children in your lives. These are things that, for the most part, come naturally to us, particularly those, I think, who seek a helping profession. Um, they tend to come really naturally. And the reason that we're highlighting them here is because they are things that we would be doing in, you know, when we're with people, when we're directly with them. And when it comes to telehealth, there are things that, we, um, that we've noticed we need to pay, pay special attention to and that they have a highlighted importance in uh, telehealth. Um, so the first one is really empathic reflection, which is often called reflective listening. And um, reflective listening, as you know, is sort of one of the, you know, that and open-ended questions are like the gold standard of empathic communication. And there's a bunch of really, really rich research just on empathic reflection um, and how much it conveys empathy and how much people often will move themselves towards, you know, healthier changes uh, in their lives just through skillful reflective listening. So very, very powerful. And the reason that we wanted to talk about it today is because when we're on the telephone, it takes on a whole nother level of importance because people cannot see our nodding, people cannot see our smiling, people do not see our looking down and intently listening to them. They can't see any of that. And I realized when I started doing sessions on the phone that it's probably been two decades since I've just talked on the phone. I talk on the phone and do other things. And so I had to retrain myself to talk on the phone and do nothing else but talk on the phone for a session. And I, I, I'm assuming that the people that I'm talking to have that history too. And so they may not assume that we're right there with them, that we're listening to them. So really like um, flexing our sort of muscles around empathic reflection and reflecting more often to let people know I'm with you, I'm right there with you. I uh, just wanna read a few of the chats that, um, wow. uh, so, Carolina said, wait, I missed this. Why would we have our phone on during a session? Lizzie, did you, I think you were talking sure, about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to clarify, it would, we're talking about if you're using your own phone um, yeah. that, to manage those alerts. And then there's some um, concern about, wait, what did, what, did, what did she mean by, or what did I mean by um, that I would be getting, that I may have be getting alerts um, or instant messages um, and, and some concerns saying, I, I guess I would disagree with the need to stop and take care of something. So it's gonna be very, very site um, specific. So at my clinic, um, occasionally, you know, we may have to, the, the culture is, if there's a, uh, an emergency, like a suicidal patient, we would get inter interrupted. And so that would be coming through on my computer. Um, and so if that were to happen, I would have to acknowledge that. Um, so, so that's, that's what I was talking about. Um, but it's going to be very, very site specific. Um, I, does that make sense? I was just, I was just typing to Carolina cause I always really appreciate when somebody yeah. says I disagree. I always appreciate it. So, um, thank you for that. I wanted to talk about this second core empathic communication strategy that again, you're probably super used to using this in your regular lives and also um, with colleagues or with clients and certainly in person. 
And it is something that seems to take on a, um, a heightened level of importance as a core strategy when we're doing telehealth. Again, if we think about talking to people on the phone, normalizing is a strategy to let people know we are not judging them. That's essentially what it is. When somebody says, I can't stop yelling at my kids, and we say to them, um, it's so hard to be struggling ourselves and be a parent. You know, we all seem to struggle with our kids sometimes getting the brunt of when we're really struggling. Um, that's a normalizing statement. We're using the term we sort of broadly there. What we're really doing with a statement like that is we're saying, I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. And normally we might not have to do that as much if someone was in person because they would see the fact that we're leaning towards them and they would see the fact that we're looking at them with an empathic, you know, that we're sort of mirroring their face. Those mirror neurons are working. Um, on the phone though, um, there's a lot more wondering how we're receiving information that people are sharing with us. So normalizing as a strategy to signal to people that we're not judging becomes really important. I would say too that my experience of doing video is very similar. Lizzie and I were talking about the fact that leaning towards someone shows empathy. So it shows a lack of judgment, whereas leaning back will show judgment. Um, even on the video, though, leaning forward doesn't take on the same significance. It doesn't seem to signal the same thing. Uh, so I find myself normalizing more as well on video. And then the last thing, and obviously this isn't a finite list. These are just three that we polled uh, for uh, two reasons. Number one, they have an enormous amount of fascinating research behind all of them as discrete skills. Um, the second one is that we use them, Lizzie and I have used them, so we feel comfortable talking about them, and that we find they take on special importance with telehealth. Um, uh, I just want to stop for a second a because, times. yeah, Ashley, first of all, thank you so much for asking that, and I feel like Lizzie and I have done some other telehealth webinars together, and this um, piece about children comes up, and so I want to put a pin in that um, and circle back to that when we um, have a discussion because I'm guess I'm wondering if some of your colleagues have experiences with that, and I know that there's um, attempts with uh, to really gather early learnings with children as well. Um, and then Sylvia said, should we keep a neutral facial expression or do more expression or do more expressions because our body language is not as evident? I think that is such a great question, and I think this piece I would love to just talk more about. I don't know if we know this for sure. And I wonder about um, matching, matching the person that we're talking to. You know, that for some people, we, we mirror people's facial expressions naturally. Those are mirror neurons, which is why masks mess that up so much, um, because our, our brain can't process the mirroring. And so uh, we're going to talk about masks, too, in a minute, with, you know, as being a, a bit of a barrier to this. Um, but the body language is really big, too. You know, some, that leaning in towards people, the kind of open posture, the lack of crossing your arms. People trust our body posture to communicate what we're really feeling, and people can't see our bodies. Um, so I feel like my tendency is to be slightly more animated, um, and I don't have any sense about um, – I, mean, I would love to hear other people's experiences with that. I just want to say, uh, sorry, one thing about the affirming strength. I think that it's one of the things, again, that our field, our discipline, um, has been talking about for decades. You know, we sort of pride ourselves in many ways about being strength focused around um, looking at, looking for um, resilience. Like we have the glasses to say what's working great here, what are the strengths, what is the resilience, and we try to keep our pathology focused lenses in the back pocket, even though it infiltrates our field a bit. Affirming strengths as a communication strategy is really to make sure that we firmly say that back to somebody. Because again, they don't necessarily have our body language or the show of our goodwill. So when somebody says, I can't take this one more minute, I've been eating like crap, I've gone back to drinking, I'm getting depressed, I'm stopped taking my medicine, um, for us to Take a breath and try to fix the problem. Don't even focus on the problem. For us to look at that and say, let me put on my glasses. What are the strengths here? Number one, this person is concerned about those things. That means they're deeply concerned about their health and mental health. 
Number two, they're sharing this with me. That means they showed up to share this with me. This is whether it's, you know, your aunt, your friends, your clients, your colleague, your coworker, someone you supervise. And so just taking a minute to take a breath, step back and say, um, I can hear how much you care about your own health and well-being. Um, otherwise, this wouldn't trouble you. I can hear that. And I so appreciate your willingness during this really difficult time to show up and share with me honestly about what's going on. Just to take a breath, put on our strength glasses, and share that with somebody. And particularly during this time, and particularly with telehealth, it seems that it's taking an outsized level of importance in conveying to people that we think well of them, that we have goodwill towards them, that we have unconditional positive regard. Elizabeth, I just wanted to add to that because you and I talk about this a lot of, you know, for you, for you as burgeoning clinicians, to get that disclosure means that you're doing something right. Like that's a cue to you that whatever you're doing, whatever strategies you're using are working because someone has just disclosed that for you. And so to hold that alongside the client's strengths is like, okay, this is, this is good. <laughs> this is working. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. Self-disclosures, people don't self-disclose unless they feel that they're going to be met with empathy. Um, so it is such, such a good sign when people feel like they can self-disclose to us. I always say we don't self-disclose to people that we think might judge us, and we probably shouldn't, which is why we should never use the word lie in health settings or mental health settings. People don't lie, they make good decisions about not sharing what they think might be judged. Um, uh, so, so I just want to do a quick check-in um, with you, Lizzie, and also invite everyone on here to weigh in, which is we have about 12 minutes or about 10 minutes left um, before we wanted to stop and have a, a, a discussion with you all. And we wanted to break out and do um, about six minutes of practice. We wanted to give you an opportunity to practice the setup not all of these things, maybe one or two of the things that Lizzie shared, um, uh, just verbalizing how you would set up with somebody and then eliciting something from your partner uh, and then using some of the core skills that we just talked about, the affirming strengths, empathic reflecting, not all of them again, maybe one of them, maybe two of them. Um, we also um, wanted to be able to talk about boundaries, which we were going to talk about after this. And I don't know if we'll have time for both of those. And I just wanted to ask if, Lizzie what you think and then also ask people if they would chat in um, how much, how strongly you feel about practicing. Lizzie, what do you think? Um, I guess it depends if, um, I think we could do it if we did, instead of 30 minutes for Q&A, we did 25. Folks, I, I mean, I, I really, what do you guys think? To me, I say go for practice because boundaries. <laughs> we would love a lot of time for Q&A from Chloe. Uh-huh. Um, we can also practice in seminars. Good point. Very good point. Um, discussion on boundaries will be great. Look okay. at them. They're like, don't make us break out into rooms and practice. <laughs> we were kind of joking. About, we were kind of joking about the introverts, you know, that like certain extroverts were all so relieved that we're going to do something besides have someone talk to us. Uh, and for introverts, you know, they're, they're like very okay. excited about boundaries and Q &A. <laughs> uh, Okay, so um, would love some Q&A specific um, non talk based services. Very interesting, and that I think involves children too. Uh, yeah, sounds like uh, people would Gosh. rather uh, so. So let's go ahead and go into boundaries because I think it is a really rich area and then we will um, break out for discussion. So there's a bunch of different pieces of boundaries, of course. Um, there's privacy. Uh, we're not going to talk about confidentiality just being a legal distinction, but um, there's our own boundaries. There's boundaries of the people that we're talking with. So um, you want to dive in, Lizzie? Sure. Well, I just, it was funny because when we were talking um, with the team and Greg about this, you know, Greg has so much experience in hospital social work and he, he brought up this, you know, in hospital social work, you literally are just uh, using a curtain and like there's some kind of shared agreement that somehow that makes things private and confidential. <laughs> um, and so 
just to kind of validate and name that that privacy and um, and boundaries differ based on based on the environment. Um, and so we no longer have the close the door in the office in the context of telehealth. So so we're going to talk about privacy and boundaries with you know for our clients, but also for ourselves. Because mm -hmm. I was in grad school, I know what it is to have roommates. Um, okay, so let's talk about our own best practice. Okay, um, so ideally a private space, right? Um, ideally, um, you have a space that is, um, you create your own sacred space. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you guys can all see Greg, I can see him now, but I do know that um, behind that curtain is just like a mess of chaos and like, just, yeah. Um, so, you know, you don't actually have to have a beautiful office. Um, of course, if you're using Zoom, you can have a background, although, you know, there's been increasing criticism of the backgrounds on Zoom as being a little bit like, also kind of racist. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's depending on your skin tone, it's, you know, not great um, for folks with darker skin or darker hair. Um, so, so just, you know, even if it's hanging up a curtain, um, it's completely fine to do that. Um, uh, and if you don't have a private space, so I know some of you have, you know, you're living back with family, there may be folks walking in the background. Um, we certainly work with clinicians who are in a shared office. And so in those cases, it is actually okay, it is acceptable to have people in the background if you have headphones on. And if you, again, have that um, set up conversation of like, there may be people in the background, I wanna let you know, um, but they can't hear what you're saying, right? Um, and so, and so just kind of bringing it into the room. Now, I do want to share with regards to patients. Um, one of my clinicians had her patient answer a telehealth video call in bed with her partner. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they just had to have that conversation. Yes, you will see my cat walk across the camera. Exactly. Um, they had to have that conversation of like, you know, is, is this okay for you? And in that case, she wanted her partner to be there for the session, which was very new. Um, I have talked to patients on BART when they're on BART and just, you know, it's just different. But those of you who have done a, a sort of community outreach, you know, like you're out in the field, in some ways you're just kind of rolling with it, right? Like there, I think the more that we can get away from like, it has to be this perfect sacred thing. And like, y'all are social workers. Um, I keep talking about like the office, but I know, um, you know, most of you, for most of us, that's actually the minority of us who have that private mm -hmm. office um, in our practice setting. And, and many of us are um, taking, we're, we're taking bus rides with our clients, um, visiting them in their SRO. So just in the same way we adapt to that, we're adapting to this. Okay. Let me see. I live with roommates, bought a sound machine for $20. Yes, sound machines, so good. Love, love sound machines. For anybody who works in primary care, Lizzie and I have worked in primary care for forever. And sound machines are deeply important because we're always right in the middle of all of, you know, we're right next door to all of the exam rooms and it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about rituals. Um, and this is kind of part of the bigger construct of self-care and making sure that this is a sustainable practice. Um, so I think pretty early on the learnings from um, telehealth and remote work for almost everyone, for almost 100% of us was like, I'm going to die because of Zoom. And, you know, with some of us with kids at home, it's like I'm doing Zoom and then I turn around and there's my life, my messy life right there. Um, and we don't have the drive home. We don't have those different um, kind of context cues that help us separate work from life, right? So some of you I know are, will be doing telehealth in the room, in, in your bedrooms, right? And, and then you're, you're trying to sleep and then you're remembering that, oh my gosh, this intense um, patient interaction. So, you know, this is a time again, um, and, and also, uh, just to pause here and say, you guys actually are at such an advantage because you, you're not 10, 15 years into you're like, these are my routines and these are the things I do. Like you guys are fresh. So you get to start, you know, this, this may be less of an issue for you. Um, 
but really the importance of ritual and separating um, work from home life is so, so, so critical. Um, and so the rituals may change, right? Um, we don't have the drive home necessarily. So um, Elizabeth and I have shared with each other some of the things that we do, but like I'll get up and just run to the bathroom and wash my hands between, between um, patient calls because mine are back to back to back. Um, I've set up my little desk here. Like I have my little, I don't know if you can see, like a little candle um, that I use and just kind of like before each patient, I just take a breath. We were joking, um, I was joking with the team, like this is an essential oil like that I probably am sniffing, like maybe, I don't know, a harmful amount of between patients, but it's working. Um, so just these little things, right? Um, for some of you, it will be covering up your computers um, when you're done with your, with, with your work. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to talk a little bit more about your rituals? Yeah, I, I it, you know, just to wind this back to empathic presence and um, being able to be equitable in who gets our best empathic presence. Um, I, I, I have, I do have a room I can work in, which is totally a, a luxury. Um, but I did have to switch positions because if it's the same desk where I do notes and work at, what I was noticing was then I would like ping, you know, to, to let somebody into a session or get on the phone. And I was still sitting in the same place. I was still, you know, I was right there at the same place and my mind couldn't switch modes. And um, I wasn't giving the best that I could to that person. And I realized that for so I've seen patients in a lot of different primary care settings. I've changed places, but I've always had a walk to the waiting room to get a patient. And many, many years ago, I had, I, I had a ritual, I think it's been a couple decades, where I walk down the hall and as I'm going into the waiting room, I say, please let me help this person. It's like my form of some kind of prayer. And it wasn't until I, real, it wasn't until I started doing telehealth that I realized I lost that. I now no longer have that, you know, one minute, that 30 seconds where I'm getting my mind to, you know, what is my deep intention with this person and to get myself present. Um, so I now switch places. I don't do any um, patient phone calls or videos in the same position that I do work. Um, so yeah, this feels big, I think, to us. A few, I'm going to um, skip over math. Yeah, let's skip right it. Now. Yeah. yeah, just because I really want to talk about this piece. Um, yeah. And I know the group does as well. And the, um, the chat, Shatisha said she lights a candle at the beginning of the day and then blows it out at the end. And there was a lot of snaps to that, which I love. And then people are talking about the white noise and brown noise. I'm with you guys. Brown noise is so much less abrasive than white noise. Yes, love it. All right. So let's talk about this, this last piece, which is acknowledging our environment, right? So yeah, Greg said something like, you're going to see the cat walk across the screen or whatever. You know, in some ways, you know, I don't, I don't think that this is still the case now in social work education, but like there was a school of thought of if you're doing psychotherapy, you know, you don't want pictures of your kids around and you just kind of like all the boundaries around like I am a, I am a therapist blank slate. You don't know about my private life. Um, kind of don't apply now um, or are much more difficult to apply. And, and I think also there's a movement and certainly Elizabeth and I feel this way of like, the more that we can humanize ourselves, you know, with appropriate boundaries, but to humanize ourselves and like acknowledge um, just the realities of our lives. Um, and even, you know, uh, I, had a, I had a client, you know, she, she was talking about homeschooling her kids and her stress and my kids were literally outside the window that's right here screaming, hi mommy, hi mommy. And we were just able to have this nice moment where I was like, I feel you as my children are literally right outside the window screaming. And it was, it was a really wonderful way to connect. But the more that we can acknowledge it, you may see someone in the background, um, you know, I'm home too, whatever that is to um, just make that connection and also reinforce safety, confidentiality, security, right? Um, you may see someone, but they can't hear you. Um, and leaning into the client's home environment, I think is, um, I think is one of the most amazing parts of video telehealth, where it gives us this added way to connect and learn something about 
the client that we we never would have that opportunity if we were back to brick and mortar you got to be within our four walls um, and so um, Elizabeth and I both have stories about that but I had a patient who was really profoundly depressed and we were talking just about what he can do to take care of himself some behavioral activation meaningful event planning and he actually took the phone out to his little tiny patio in this shared apartment and showed me this rose bush and this these roses that he's been um, cultivating and it was such a beautiful moment where I, I never would have known he had a garden or maybe he would have told me but just this pride and so we still check in about those roses um, and it's just so wonderful so being able to do that is is actually um, it's such an advantage yeah I think that this piece I think has been the most interesting exciting promising piece of telehealth to me is uh, it to, to Lizia and I, which is to be able, I mean, number one, just the idea that someone does not have to leave their home to see you, to, you know, take away some of the childcare barriers, to take away some of the transportation barriers, to take away some of the financial um, barriers, to take away some of the um, environment barriers, like social anxiety about waiting in a waiting room. Um, I mean, it's, I, I think it's phenomenal that we, uh, you know, in 14 days, the entire system transitions to being able to um, have patients pick up the phone and, and get services and help. We think it's amazing. And, and I think that's what we feel most passionately about is keeping this benefit, making sure that this continues to be a long-term benefit because we've known for a long time that we should be going um, this direction. So, and I too have, for me, really touching moments and stories about seeing people in their home environment. Um, and I'm, I think when we think about power differentials that are um, implied anytime we're a helper and we're helping somebody and the long and difficult and racist and sexist history of, um, therapy services, um, I think that we're, we're at this time where we have something that is really evening us out. It's really a way to mitigate the power differential in, I think, a real and meaningful way. Um, so I just wanted to say for a minute that um, I had, um, I, I had this, I had an experience that I think is really common that many people talked about and a lot of clinicians talked about, which is within like the first month of doing telehealth, I had more patients ask me how I was than I've ever had in my whole career. And um, I think that's really interesting for all kinds of reasons. Like not only are we able to see people in their environment and get a fuller picture of who they are, including specifically getting a fuller picture of their strengths. I've been able to meet people's children and comment on their parenting and how they're looking at their children. I've been able to meet people's husbands that I would have never normally been able to meet. Um, uh, but then also to have a client interact with us as if we're also a human among humans. And to think about the boundaries more, just the boundaries are really around the protection of focus. The boundary is around that you are the focus. And I, you know, we are going to focus on you and I'm gonna hold the space for the focus on you. And that boundaries for boundaries sake essentially um, underscore a power differential that ultimately is uh, an equity um, problem. So we're really excited about this piece. Um, I see a bunch of chats coming in and we did want to go to Q&A. Um, so I've been taking notes on some of the things we wanted to talk about and Greg, you know, had chatted in that he said he had heard from a lot of students that hearing trauma disclosures while they were at home working was difficult. Um, so let me just take off, let me take this off so we can see each other a little better. 